Uh, now, I come from a place called Cape Town. Uh, any of you have been to South Africa before? Oh, there's a few of you. You're all invited to come to Cape Town. If you, if you haven't been to Cape Town, you haven't been to South Africa. They've also started this whole kind of movement called Silicon Cape. Um, you know the Silicon Valley type of thing? That they're now trying to replicate something in Cape Town. Of course, we also have a little bit of a valley uh, like trying to create this whole kind of ecosystem. So there's about a thousand, I think a thousand startups that's really kind of just kind of blossomed out of nowhere, uh, which is quite fascinating. And most of them have an interesting kind of technology and also kind of biotechnology as well. So, so the story that I'm going to share today is basically from the Cape Flats of Love. Right? Um, I'm going to tell you a bit more about what the Cape Flats is. Now, on this journey, it's, you know, any journey was a very exciting journey. It's not always the way you anticipate it to be. Um, like I said, I, the way I entered into technology was not that I always wanted to go and do something about computers. To be, to be truthful, uh, the first time I saw a computer in my life was when I went to university. Uh, my first job was basically, I was pushing a trolley. Um, what do they call that? Not a porter. A porter is more formal. Uh, my only lifelong dream was I wanted to wear a shirt and a tie. So I always wanted to work in the office because nobody in my community has ever gone to work wearing a shirt and a tie. You know, that was my, my dream. Um, so no, no one in my family ever completed school. Um, single parent, grew up in poverty. Uh, you know, and, and for me that was my dream. I can just go to work in a shirt and a tie. Everybody will see I'm wearing a tie and a shirt, you know, going to work. So, it purely just happened that the way I came across studying information technology and programming was that after two years of pushing trolleys around, I basically realized that, you know what, um, this is what I'm doing, it's not really going to get me to wear a shirt in a time. And I basically applied for a job at the company which I never got, and I made a promise to myself that if I don't get this job, it was basically an offer to, to be an administrator. If I don't get the job, then I will quit what I'm doing and then I'm going to go inside. And I eventually decided that I didn't get the job and I quit. So I went, the first person I walk, that I walked into, I asked the person, the person said, Bottom, what are you doing? I said, well, I've decided to go and study. They said, what are you going to study? I said, I've got no idea. They said, um, which university are you going to go to? I said, I've got no idea. That was how much career guidance I had. You know, so, they said, well, there's this thing called information technology. You know, so it sounds kind of cool. I said, oh, that's amazing. And what is information technology? Um, they said, well, I, they don't know. It's just apparently an a, a, a in-word, you know, it's a buzzword at the time. Um, so I, I watch a lot of movies. Um, I don't know if any of you ever watch movies with the FBI, where they're always hanging on these phones listening to people's conversations, like the telephone phone. I, I always used to watch a lot of FBI movies, so I thought information technology was basically where I was going to hang on a pole, take a little wire, and I'm going to listen to information using this technology. That's what I thought, because I've never seen or touched a computer in my life before. I thought it. So, lo and behold, the first day when I go to the university, I see this thing that's called a computer, which looked like a little school television portable television screen and basically that was you know my introduction to computer programming uh, and can, can you believe it I, I decided to go and study computer programming so I don't have a passion for technology to be honest it's very really strange I started I failed all my first subjects uh, my first term and basically it was never something that I was really good at until someone I played soccer as well, or football, until I basically, I used to not go to class because I failed all my subjects. And that's for you that study, please don't do this, don't try this at all. Right? And fortunately there was a guy that, that broke my ankle while playing football. He was, that's the best thing that's ever happened to me, breaking my leg. Right? Uh, because that meant that I couldn't play football. So the only place I could spend time with was at the library. And I started reading the books. And that was when the light went on. Oh, this is what the computer things are all about. And long story short, I ended up becoming a lecturer in computer science. 
and I've spent over 10 years there. So for someone that doesn't like computers and no clue, I've spent a fairly long bit of time there. But the reason why I spent a lot of time there was because I had a passion for people. And that is basically what this journey is all about. So, good morning to you guys that just joined us. So Cape Town, let me just quickly give you Cape Town, we've got lovely beaches over here, as you can see. We've got um, also a, a, a mountain, not quite like in Kilimanjaro. Our mountain is very flat, um, right? Um, but I personally haven't climbed the mountain, I'll be honest. Uh, I, I went up there with a little table of coffee. Um, lovely beaches, you know, it's a lovely place. Um, the population of Cape Town is about 7 million people that we have at the moment. However, not all of it is so beautiful and, and blue, right? There are other places in Cape Town called the Cape Flats where there's quite a bit of... where people are experiencing different kinds of environments, where people do have a lot of kind of social problems. Um, for example, in the community where we are based, we've got 70% unemployment. Um, and that is fairly high. Uh, I mean, for anybody that works in HR, that literally tells you that you have a problem, you know. Um, and that's not just, we're not talking about employment that's a problem, it means that a number of other kinds of social ills that we find. Um, we have problems when it comes to gang violence, drugs. You have kids as young at the age of 10 years old that are becoming drug pushers. So that's the one way of how they can generate income so they can buy them some shoes, you know. Um, and literally, in this community we were working, it's completely just a community where there's all kinds of social problems. So if I had to ask you what is the way or the one solution or the one thing that I felt that people in this community needed, I realized it wasn't really technology. Right? The one thing that I found when I was walking in my community that, if, that people were looking for was people were actually looking for hope. The worst thing you could find is looking into someone's eyes and you see that they've lost all hope. Because that is something that you can see. You can see when someone has lost hope. And if there's no hope, then there's really little that you can do with someone if they don't have any hope. You know, and hope is basically having a, you know, a believing today, believing in something about today, and having an expectancy for tomorrow. That is what I really think hope is all about. So, uh, this guy, I don't know if you all know him, I think he's a pretty wise guy. Right? He said something, it goes by the name of Einstein. Right? He says something, a concern for man and his faith always need to be at the center of any kind of scientific thing that you do. So in other words, if you are a software developer or you, whatever you do, it's all meaningless if the well-being of people is not at the center of it. And it doesn't just mean your well-being, it actually means the well-being of people around you as well. And that was basically this kind of journey route that I basically took. So, just a, a, a thinking that came to me was that as innovators, how many of you think you are innovators or would like to think you are innovator or creator? No? Can I raise your Are you innovator? Do you think you are creator? Now I'm scared, nobody's raising their hands at all. So, but as innovators, we really need to start shifting our focus, I think. You know, we need to stop saying, oh, you know, it's the world of innovation. You know, it's a it's kind of technology world. You know, we like using those kind of words. Um, I talk about buzzwords. Um, I remember when I was at, at school. I um, remember when people, I mean, I used to be a dreamer. Right? So people, teachers always used to tell me, if I sit at class, they would say, Marlon, get out of class, stop dreaming. Right? I, they told me that all the time, every day. But today, if you're not in the cloud, you know, cloud computing. If you're not in the cloud, then you're not cool anymore. But back then, it was a terrible thing. You know, so we have all these kind of buzzwords that we are using. And the big thing is, we basically have to change from the world of innovation to really be innovation for the world. And that is where you're going to find the true value. We all talk about, oh, what's the next big thing? You know, we want to do the next big Facebook. The reality is Facebook is there. You know, you can't do the next big Facebook. But there are other things that we can do that the world is looking for. And I think that is really where we found the biggest value. So, the organization or the movement that I'm with is called Art Lab, right? Now, Art Lab is what people call a living lab. A living lab 
Do you know what a living lab is? Anybody here that knows what's a living lab? There was a course here about living lab that I attended. Oh, so tell us what they told me. Let's see. A, a, a total version of what a living lab is. 140 characters. Um, just uh, people of the United States in a village or whatever. And uh, together they see their problems and find a way together how to solve them. Who got them? That's very good. Well, you still have two characters there. That's good. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah, so, so basically, it's in a real life city, creating opportunities mm. where people together, working with different partners, come together to solve problems using kind of innovative processes. It doesn't necessarily have to be technology. Right? Um, for example, if we can, let's say you've got an amazing idea of how you can s solve the, the road issue or the transportation problem. Not that you have a, a transportation or road problem in Tanzania. <laughs> no, of course not. No, you don't. No. Um, but I'm sure there needs to be some kind of creative thinking to try and solve that or be innovative in doing that. Right? So, so our lab is basically an organization that started on the Cape Labs. So when we started, we didn't have, it wasn't a big funding company that came in and said, okay, this is what we're going to do. It purely started with one person wanting to make a difference in one person's life. We didn't have a name or anything at the time. So, the first thing that we had to realize, I'm just going to tell you the journey of our labs, was we had to see things differently. Okay, that's the first thing you always have to remember. In other words, instead of seeing this, that's another picture of the community we are based in, which is called Bridgetown on the Cape Flats, right? It's also known as Ugly Town. Um, and, uh, do we all you sitting here have heard of Silicon Valley? Silicon Valley? Yes? No? Silicon Valley in the US where they, all the Facebooks and the Googles are, they are all based in this place where they do all kinds of technology stuff. Um, and, and of course that place is in America. Now where we are based, we also have Americans, but it's, called, it's a gang, a, a gang called the Americans. So they even have the American flag, they, they, you know, they do the exact same thing. The only difference is they don't have any passports. Any, any, they've never been to America, but they call themselves Americans. It's the largest gang in South Africa. They're about a quarter million people. It's actually an army, a quarter million is an army, not a gang. Right? And the fact, and the way it started was, we had to decide to look at things differently. Instead of looking at this, we had to start seeing this. You had to, it's the same community, and just looking the opposite direction and seeing a sunset. We had to see things differently. And that's going to be very important for you as well. Right? So, we also have to realize, and I'm, I'm telling you this, so this is very important, that diamonds do come from the rock. So we never had great. The people that we started with was basically ex-gang members and ex-drug members, ex-leaders. For example, I'll show you quickly. Um, for example, this guy, he was the first crystal meth drug dealer in our community. The last encounter he had with his parents, right, was when he basically was stripping, the drugs was getting going to his head, and he basically had his mother and his father hostage, and he had his mom with a knife, he had it around the throat, he wanted to kill him. Right? So this was, this is a, one of the first people that joined our program as an innovator. Okay, so you can see it's not your ordinary innovators. Uh, so this was the first group. We then work, started working with a community organization as well as the university. And what we basically did, we wanted to start sharing stories of hope. Remember in the beginning I told you? The thing that was missing in our community was hope. And in this group, I can tell you, there's someone that's a hitman, someone that's like an assassin. People pay them to destroy other people, remove them from the earth. Um, we had someone that was the most wanted for organized crime. Right? So he was, a, he was very good at organizing. I remember when I asked him that question, I said, listen, what do you like doing? He says, Marlon, I like organizing. So I said, I can see that I'm looking at a criminal record here. You know? um, and he was the most wanted for organized crime. Uh, they, I mean, whatever you could think of, we had a, a guy that he was running the, the largest prostitution ring. I mean, these were bad people, 